I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. The Rocky Horror Picture Show isn't just a film with great songs, amazing costumes, and muscles. It's also a declaration of sexual freedom, of coming out, and giving yourself over to absolute pleasure. This is a story about the night the Rocky Horror Picture Show changed my life. All aboard and welcome to Matt Baum's Culture Cruise, where we take a deep dive on LGBTQ themes on TV, in movies, and books, games, and more. This time we're looking at 1973's Rocky Horror Picture Show, full of subversive themes like the erosion of heterosexual normalcy, finding your fellow queer weirdos, and the awakening of desire. Culture Cruise is supported by the folks who pledge a dollar or more a month on Patreon, folks like Andrew Zer. Thanks, Andrew. Head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum or click the link in the description to join the folks who make the show possible. The Rocky Horror Picture Show was a huge failure, at least when it premiered. It was too weird, too queer, too musical at a time when moviegoers stopped caring about show tunes. But within a few years, it found a new life as an underground phenomenon. Here's how a Rocky screening is depicted just five years later in the movie Fame. It's become an institution for weirdos where everyone dresses up, shouts along, participates in rituals. It's like a Catholic mass, but for drama club kids. So how did that happen? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the film. Rocky Horror starts in a suburban utopia. Straight people are getting married, like they do, and everything is so very traditional, especially Brad and Janet. Everyone knows that Betty's a wonderful little cook. Yes. But behind the familiar old institutions lurks something sinister. Brad and Janet declare their love on the edge of a graveyard, and they're being watched over by someone creepy. And on a dark and stormy night, their car breaks down, and they stumble into a world they never knew existed, and sexual desires they never knew how to acknowledge. The first time I saw Rocky Horror Picture Show was dark and stormy as well. I was caught in a blizzard, at a party, in a mansion, with a sexy man. And by the time I watched the sun come up in the morning, I'd been stripped of nearly everything I arrived with. A little context, in high school, I was Brad and Janet. I grew up next to a cemetery. I was raised to be well-behaved, polite, stuffy, and pretty square. Do one of you guys know how to Madison? Mm. Rocky Horror entered my life a few days before Christmas at a drama club party held at a rich kid's family mansion on top of a hill. There was a blizzard that night and I nearly didn't make it, but when I arrived, everyone was gathered in the basement watching an old VHS copy of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. There was a couple making out on a couch, some kids were smoking pot, there was loud music. I probably would have left if there hadn't been a blizzard outside. I had no idea what I had walked into. Uh, it's probably some kind of hunting lodge for rich weirdos. <laughs> it's the same vibe that Brad and Janet find themselves walking into. Unfamiliar, scary, dangerous. And yet, there's something about it that's hard to resist. When everyone starts dancing, even the stuffy criminologist joins in, with instructions and everything. It's just a jump to the left. Still, at that party, I was incredibly nervous, and a little jealous of Janet when she fainted and didn't have to make small talk. I was lucky though, there was a cute senior at the party named Patrick, and he taught me the dance, as it happens in the movie. So I thought I'd figured out what the movie is. Oh, okay, it's a good old fashioned traditional musical, right? Then this happens. I'm just a sweet transvestite. This is Dr. Frankenfurter, the host of the party, and he kind of broke my brain when I first saw him. He's not a drag queen exactly, he's not masculine exactly, he's not anything exactly. He's physically a boy, but flamboyant and queer and totally unashamed, and he was everything I wished I wasn't afraid to be. Back then, I was still closeted, embarrassed enough about my skin, my hair, my voice. I wasn't eager to come out and give myself something else to be self-conscious about. At that time, the extent of my flirting with boys was asking to borrow a pen and then putting the cap in my mouth so I could pretend that they had done the same thing and it was like we were making out in a three-way with a pen. This was, in hindsight, a sign of some slight sexual repression. The party guests in the movie are not repressed, and I was so jealous. They're having fun, and Frankenfurter is having the most fun of all. Brad and Janet, in contrast, don't even seem to know they're in a musical. I'm glad we caught you at home. Could we use your phone? Rocky Horror came out at a particularly tumultuous time for queer folks. 1975. Fifteen years earlier was the end of the 1950s. The problem of homosexuality is age old. In ancient Greece and Rome, this condition was apparently accepted as a way of life. 
In this country, the opposite is true. 15 years later was the start of the 1990s. Everyone wants someone to grow old with, and shouldn't everyone have that chance? Uh. Sophia, I think I see what you're getting at. I don't think you do. Blanche, will you marry me? <laughs> Rocky Horror sits halfway between a time when queer people were arrested, beaten, even given lobotomies, and a time when we queer people could fight for the right to live the lives of our choosing. When I saw the contrast between the stuffy straights and the dancing guests, I knew exactly which side I wanted to be on. Brad and Janet get stripped out of their wet clothes, and I wanted that to happen to me. I wanted someone to come along and pull away every piece of my heterosexual disguise, which was, admittedly, already quite flimsy. I wanted to say what I was out loud. I wanted to be... Vulnerable. <laughs> the film started firmly rooted in heterosexual tradition. And now, that's being slowly dissolved as the party grows ever more queer. Dr. Frankenfurter unveils his monster, essentially a gay pride mummy, which, when unwrapped, is a pure sex object. Now, Brad and Janet, what do you think of him? Well, I don't like men with too many muscles. I didn't make him for you! I gasped when I heard that line. If this muscle man wasn't for a woman, who is he for? Oh, he's for men. This is an object of desire designed for a gay gaze. As a sheltered teen, I had never seen anything like that. And a lot of audiences in the mid-70s probably hadn't either. Eventually, the movie introduces Meatloaf as Eddie to add a little heterosexual counterpoint. It's probably not a coincidence that the party I was at drifted away from the screen during his scene. A couple people broke away to play Spin the Bottle, and when Patrick the Senior joined them, I decided I needed to as well. That's how I had my first kiss with the boy, accompanied by Meatloaf on the saxophone. I remember thinking, oh my god, what did I just do? Was it wrong to kiss a boy? Fortunately, the movie has an answer to that. There's no crime in giving yourself over to pleasure. That might be the most important line of the film. Give yourself over to pleasure. Have fun. Don't be afraid of feeling good. For a closeted gay kid in the 90s, those words had incredible power. Now imagine the power those words must have had in the 1970s when this film first came out. It was only a few years after Stonewall. A lot of doctors still considered homosexuality a mental illness. Being gay was illegal in large parts of the country. The social pressure to be straight, to disguise yourself, to never give yourself over to what felt right was overwhelming. So it's no surprise that Rocky Horror was a commercial flop when it first came out. But then it found a new life as a midnight movie. When the film screened at weird hours in weird theaters, it drew crowds of weird people who dressed up, reenacted the dances, and shouted at the screen with new dialogue. These were folks hungry for something queer on screen. They might look unremarkable by day, but by night they could reveal themselves. Here's a teenager talking about the movie's fans in 1978. We're all quite normal, really. That's Michael Stipe, by the way, 18 years old, before he formed the band R.E.M. Not a bad look for him. Whether in the 70s, the 90s, or today, Rocky Horror is a movie by, for, and about people who feel like aliens and outsiders. And the movie says to them, don't worry, you're not alone. People like us can find each other at parties in the movie and at parties in real life. Once you do, you can drop the exhausting attempts to blend, stop hiding who you are and what you want, and just give yourself over to pleasure. Like this. Touch, 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 touch me. I was sitting next to Patrick, the senior, when this song came on, and I kept wishing that, as with the time warp, he would help me reenact it. But instead, he grew a bit bored with the movie and walked upstairs to cause some more mayhem. I followed him just in time to see him walk fully dressed into an indoor pool because he thought it was funny. It was more hot than funny, definitely hotter than the pool scene I was missing in the movie downstairs. Eventually, someone found him some dry clothes and a towel, and I stood outside the bathroom door listening to him get dressed, wondering what I should say as the words of a song floated up from the basement. Those voices chanting over and over, don't dream it, be it, they were telling me exactly what I needed to do. Rocky Horror ends with the party clearing away, the house blasting off, and the survivors staggering out into the morning sun. They might return to their dreary lives, but it's unlikely they'll forget what they've been through. And more likely, they've been changed forever. And then, at my party, the sun was just coming up when a couple of us decided we should go for a walk. We all bundled up in winter coats and headed outside. 
The snow was fresh and blue with that 5 a.m. light, and there was a little bit of a mist rising off the ground as we trudged through the woods around the house. Out of nowhere, Patrick said, do you call yourself gay or homosexual? And for a second, I heard those words from the song again, don't dream it, be it. So I said, queer. And he said, okay. And that was it. I was out. It was so easy. I kept waiting to feel embarrassed now that I'd said it out loud, but the embarrassment never came. I did what the movie said. In the year that followed, I had my first boyfriend and my first kiss that hadn't been assigned to me by a random lucky bottle spin. I went from the background of the chorus to the lead in the next year's school play. I played Jesus in Godspell, which I did as flamboyantly as possible, essentially the messiah by way of Frankenfurter. I started dressing loud and adopted a truly mortifying hairstyle that would have fit alongside magenta and riffraff. At least some of these things I should have been embarrassed about, but instead I just felt good. I felt pleasure. And as Rocky Horror teaches us, there's no crime in giving yourself over to that. Land ho, we're pulling into port. Thanks for cruising along with us, and thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with a pledge of a dollar or more a month on Patreon. Folks like Andrew Zur. Head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum, or click the link in the description to check out the perks available to backers. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'm needed in the Zen Room.